Hello and welcome to our lecture. My name is Chris Gall and the lecture is written and given by me. So today's lecture corresponds to topic 1.3, the power of geographic data in the College Board course and exam description version 1 effective 2019. The enduring understandings for today's lecture are that geographers use maps and data to depict relationships of time, space, and scale. The learning objective for today's lecture is to explain the effects of decision making of decisions made using geographical information. The essential knowledge for today's lecture are that geospatial and geographical data, including census data and satellite imagery, are used at all scales for personal business and or, or personal business and organizational and governmental decision making purposes. There's very little actual text on the accompanying slides, so don't worry if you're just planning to listen to the audio, you won't miss much. In class, I tend to talk for a slide and allow my students to write notes about what they just heard to help them focus on the hearing and to practice prioritizing information. I would strongly recommend that you pause the video or the audio periodically in order to finish your notes. When taking notes, focus on the, getting the major ideas and not on writing down what I say verbatim, that is to say word for word. Instead, put it in your own language. This processing step will help you better learn and master the information and to retain it for the AP exam in May. And now, enjoy the lecture and I hope you learn a lot. So, geographic data gets used all the time for a wide variety of purposes. You use geographic data when you decide to walk, when you decide which route to take when walking to the park, for example. Um, local governments use geographic data when they set boundaries for schools or when it when they decide where to put a road through or whether a certain parcel of land should be zoned for a mixed use industrial residential or commercial they have to weigh what that designation will mean to other businesses and residents nearby they also use the data to decide things like where the utilities should be put in even as i type this there's a construction crew up the street from my house replacing a pipe that is running under some of the concrete on my street a few years ago, Sound Transit, the regional transit authority for the Seattle metropolitan area, was deciding which route to use as they continue to expand the light link service from Tacoma all the way up to Everett. One of the proposed routes went literally through my house. Other proposals included along I-5, I live about half a mile from I-5, along Military Road and along Highway 99. The board making the decision needed to weigh several factors, including things like the cost. They ultimately have to purchase and condemn property that they are going to run the line through, even if it's not already, if, assuming it's not already owned by the city or by the state. Where the actual stop was to go, I live less than a mi an eighth of a mile from Highline Community College. What the impact on the traffic patterns would be, who was going to be using the route, how much parking was going to be needed. I could go on, but you get the idea. Ultimately, they decided to run along 99 and to cut back towards I-5 a bit for the station. It'll be behind the lows if you're familiar with the area. The point is this. Geography is a huge impact on the work that gets done, and geographic thinking influences a wide variety of things in our life. State governments use geographic data in similar ways, deciding whether to fund certain road projects, how voting districts will be divided, who's responsible for which types of pollution in a given area, and so forth. The important thing to remember here is that everybody, at all scales, uses geographic data on a regular and routine basis. One of the many things that states do is to help determine who is responsible for cleaning up various industrial pollutants and what will be considered cleaned up, that is to say, what's, what's the, ma the minimum threshold that's acceptable. In other words, which types of household, how, or, sorry, in other words, what are the acceptable thresholds for various chemicals that do not occur naturally in our environment? To do that, they need an in-depth understanding of the modern and historical geography of the area. For example, if it's currently a grass field but used to be a, series, a, a manufacturing plant and before that it was farmland, what chemicals might you expect to find and what do you find at what levels and in what locations? Are those chemicals leaking into the watershed? If so, at what rates? Who deposited which chemicals? Who currently owns the land and or the companies that polluted the land? What are their responsibilities? What load will the state bear in helping to pay, up, pay for the cleanup, if any? State governments also use data to determine artificial boundaries, things like voting districts. There's a ton of logic to voting districts and some really awesome statistical analysis when you look at the human factors. Things like demographics, how those populations voted in previous elections, who is moving into or out of a given area, and how those things will influence voting trends. You get the idea. There's very little logic to voting districts when you look at things like natural boundaries. For example, on our map here, uh, which is actually from the 19th century and technically it's a political cartoon. 
Okay. But in general, things like rivers and mountains have no direct influence on where the boundaries of a congressional district might be, for example. It's all geographic data, but some is more relevant than others in this case. The federal government uses a plethora of geographic data as well. Everything from census data, censuses occur every 10 years here in the United States, and the goal is to count the population to determine a wide variety of things, from how much funding states will get for various programs like public schools, to how many congressional representatives a state is apportioned. Every state gets two senators regardless of size, but only one representative for every 747,000 people on average. Each state gets at least one representative regardless of population, however. It's geographic data that decides the route of new interstate highways, for example, or where to place border crossing stations. It's geographic data that allows the federal flood insurance program to set premiums that are different from one region to another. If you're looking at where to do something, or why something is happening where it is, or which route to go, that's all using geographic data. If a state official is trying to decide whether the owner of a given parcel of land is responsible for damage to the watershed from the factory that they built, that's geographic data. If it has to do with why something is happening where it is, or how we get from place to place, then the answer can be found in geographic data. So, to wrap things up, the essential knowledge for this lecture. Go ahead, check your notes, and see if you've got some information pertaining to the, the following. Geospatial and geographical data, including census data and satellite imagery, are used at all scales for personal, business, and organizational and governmental decision-making purposes. So I will see you with our next lecture.